you have your Bibles today, go to the Old Testament, if you would, to the book of Joshua. Turn to the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 3 and 4. Joshua chapter 3 and 4. The older I get, the older I get. Don't you love saying that? The older I get, the more I realize that life isn't always easy. It's a great story uh, from some years ago, I don't know, nine, ten years ago in our house. I'm out in the yard, I'm working on a, a patio at the time. My wife is inside making toast. She, and all of a sudden she starts screaming for me, because the toaster started to spark and then it burst into flames. So our toaster's on fire. At that moment, our son, who's probably, I don't know, 11, 12, somewhere in there, one of our second son, Conrad, comes in. He's got an armful, for whatever reason, of mugs. He's so overwhelmed, he drops the mugs. So the toaster catches fire. Mugs are shattered on, on the floor. Landon, one of our sons, is trying to get water to put out the fire. His mom is screaming at him, not sure if you want to throw water on an electrical fire. Our, our little girl, who's trying to, being potty trained at the time, decides that all this is too much for her, and she waters the carpet, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and all that in 15 seconds. If that's 15 seconds, you know what a lifetime can bring. Life isn't always easy. All kinds of hardship. Sometimes it feels like the things that we want to achieve, the goals that we want to meet, there's always this wall of this mountain in the way and we can't get past it, we can't get through it. We, we have the dream, we have the goal and it just seems to fade and ebb away because we're not getting there. We can never seem to get where... I'm hoping to go, and maybe it's a small thing, maybe it's a big thing. This morning I want to talk about the hard journey to a better place, and we're going to have a lesson that we learn from the Israelites, and I want us to look at verse 14. Joshua 3, verse 14, and I'd like to read all the way down into chapter 4, uh, if you'll follow along with me. It says this, so when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan... The priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood, st flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan. While the water flowing down to the sea of the Arabah, the Salt Sea, was completely cut off, so the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Verse 17, the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Now we're in chapter 4 and verse 1. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, and to carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men. He had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and he said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you in the future when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut, cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we gather in this room and we gather with a heart, with hearts, hearts yielded to your spirit, 
Father, let the Holy Spirit move in this place, yielded to your word. Let the word of power come into our lives and transform us. Lord, mold us, shape us, make us exactly as we are to be in Christ. Lord, wash us through the word and, and Lord, do in us what only you can do. Fill us fresh and new with the Spirit this morning. Father, I pray that I would decrease, you would increase, and that, Father, you would look down and, and as a father upon children, so overjoyed because we are obedient children, we are swift to be hearers and doers of your word. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. So the story is, in real rapid form, something like this. God spoke to a man, his name was Abraham. He was in a place called Ur of the Chaldees, a distance from Canaan, from this land. And God speaks to him and says, go to the land I'm going to show you. So Abraham takes the trip. He is a, a, a herder of animals and he takes uh, his clan and his animals and he goes to this place, Abraham has a son, he has more than one, but a particular son, Isaac, a son that we call the son of promise, and, and Isaac has a son, he's more than one, but his son, Jacob. Jacob at one point wrestles with an angel, and, and his name is changed, and so his name is changed from Jacob to Israel, and Israel means he contends or wrestles or struggles with God, and and that's a story, that's a name that kind of tells a story of a people, Israel. Israel has 12 sons, or Jacob has 12 sons. And if you know the story of Joseph and, and all that happens there, which we won't get into, then you'll know that there's a point at which this family and all of these sons make their way to, from where they're at to Egypt, and they, they live in Egypt, and they grow, they grow in into a nation over 400 years, they grow into a nation that numbers into the millions. And so they're a large group from, from 12 sons to 12 tribes, 12 sons to, that make the 12 tribes of this great nation. And the, the Pharaoh that knew Joseph, one of these sons who had become second in the land of Egypt, only to Pharaoh, that, that, that Pharaoh and others like him who knew about Joseph they went away and, and there came a Pharaoh who didn't know all about this and, and the people of Israel had become subjugated and they had, had, had been really forced into labor and enslaved, serving in Egypt and then they're miraculously delivered. You know the Red Sea story, God parts the sea, they're miraculously delivered and you know the story of the plagues and and, and then they, they go and God's going to get them back to the land that they left hundreds of years before when they were just a, a small family. Now they're a nation. They're heading back to this land. And so they go into the land and there's 12 spies, one spy from each of these tribes and 10 come back with a negative report, two come back with a positive report. The 10 are afraid. And so... For a number of reasons, God says, not yet. And they wander around in a wilderness for 40 years. And then we come to this passage, because they're about to cross a river, the River Jordan, and make their way into the promised land, the place of promise, back to where they had been, back to where Abraham had been called. They're coming back to the land. It's the land of promise, 40 years of wilderness, back into this land. Recall the name of Israel. He struggles with God. And if you think for a moment with me about Israel, and I'd like to do that in order to set the stage for this morning, we need to think about what is happening, not just what has happened, but what is even happening today and perhaps what has happened over the centuries. It's a miracle, isn't it, that Israel even exists at all? Isn't it a miracle? It's kind of a, a strange thing if you begin to think about it that this small, inconsequential nation, you know, 
You don't even have to be a student of history. You just have to know a little bit about current events and you wonder why is the whole world, it seems, so concerned about little Israel? What is that? You even go back and the Seleucid Empire, the the great Greek Empire back before the time of Christ in the intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament There was a king of Syria, one of these Seleucid kings, and he he set up in the altar. So they came, they desecrated the temple of the Lord, they set up an altar to Zeus, and they sacrificed an unclean animal, a pig there. We call this, it's been referred to as the abomination of desolation. Persecution way back in that time, you can go through history. The Romans destroyed the temple in A.D. 70, You can continue on through history, even into the Middle Ages. What do you see? You you see that there's exile. Jews are constantly being moved, even throughout Europe. They're pushed out of one country to the next. There's massacres. You can go into the, the world of Islam, when Islam came about, and what do you see? You see exile, you see subjugation, you see massacre. You can look at uh, even more modern times. You can go to the Tsarist Russia throughout the 1800s and you, you see the same. You see turmoil, exile, struggle. Why? You've got to ask yourself why? And yet these people still prevail. They, 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 they still succeed. They still overcome. It's an amazing story. You look at the 1850s, the 1860s, the 1870s, there are pogroms in the Middle East and other places. The people are, are persecuting the Jews. It is sanctioned by local authorities. You go 1870s, 80s, 90s, into the 20th century, you see the same thing all the way up to World War II. You, you, you know the story. You've heard the story. Why? Why? You see this story of struggle from wilderness, from suffering, from hardship, trying to get past to promise to a better place. And through it all, through it all, if you look closely, if you study closely, you'll see the miraculous power of God. You'll see God's hand even through the struggle, through the turmoil. This morning you might feel like, you know, I want to take that story and look at ourselves, but you might feel like, Eric, you don't know my struggle. You don't know the situation and you don't know the length of time or whatever it is. You, you're, you don't really know what I've been dealing with and it's true. Maybe nobody in this room knows, but God knows. God knows. And I believe that today... We have a lesson from the the word, the eternal word of God. Maybe it's a theology, if you will, on prevailing through hardship to reach the promises of God, to make it to a better place. Jesus said these words in the New Testament. You heard these. He said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Hallelujah. The psalmist David said, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many are the troubles of a righteous man, but it says the Lord has delivered him out of them all. From wilderness to promise in the name of Jesus. How do we make it there? Number one. Number one, remember in this theology of prevailing through hardship to a better place, remember that the darkest places are where God shines the brightest. The darkest places in your life are those places where Jesus will shine the brightest. Joshua 3, verse 14. When people broke camp to cross the Jordan, says the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Let me just stop for a moment there. 
the priest carrying the ark, the box, that represents the place of the presence of God in their context. We've talked about this before, the, the ark of the covenant, the box. There's the cherubim, angels on, on top. There's a mercy seat. This ark is being carried. There are poles they use to carry it. The priests are going ahead of the people. God is leading the way. God is leading the way. And I want to say to you this morning, whatever it is that you are going through or maybe that you will have to go through in the future, I want to encourage you just from that first verse, that first out, that kind of the beginning right here, listen, that we as believers who followers of Christ need to always remember we're followers of a Christ. We need to let God lead the way. We err when we try to get out in front of God. God wants to go out in front of us. So the ark went ahead of them. Verse 15, it says, the Jordan is at flood stage all during the harvest. It's interesting that it, it is something that the, the writer wanted to make sure we understood, that it's, it's the Jordan, it's a river, I get it, but it's at flood stage and this is the time that God chose. Not the time when the river's lesser, but it is the harvest time. It's late April, it's early May, and, and at this time, waters from the mountains, the snows have melted, and, and the water is, is deeper, and it's not just deeper. Flood stage means it, it's running swiftly, because the Jordan, the name Jordan means the descender. The Jordan River from the, the Sea of Galilee in the north down to the Dead Sea, it descends, and the, the, the the, the drop is such that when there's a good volume of water, it moves swiftly. The Jordan is the descender, and, and so it's at flood stage, so it's deep, maybe 12 feet in some spots, and it's running swiftly. This is not the time you'd go across. This is not the time that you'd make the passage across the Jordan if you have hundreds of thousands, millions of people to get across, you'd wait for a better time. Do you ever find yourself saying that to God? God, now? Now's the time? Do you ever do that and you kind of bargain with God, help God out a little bit? God, you know, why don't we wait on this? Why don't we turn things around? God, let's, let's figure out a better, a better time, a better place, better season. Why is it that somehow God delights to take what seems to be the impossible and in the moment of the impossible, that's where God does a mighty work? Samson, you know the story, maybe Samson. In Judges 15, what did he have to fight a thousand Philistines? Great weaponry, a new Sherman tank, no, what did he have? A jawbone of a donkey. That's what God gave him. Here you go, Samson. Make it work. David. The Israelites didn't have a giant. The Philistines did. His name was Goliath. 1 Samuel 17. Who's, what, what, what does David have? He's got a mighty armor, Saul's armor. No, he doesn't. He doesn't even choose that. He has five stones and a sling. He doesn't even need five stones, he just needs one. God, this is not the time. God, why now? God delights in doing mighty things. Think of when the temple was rebuilt, that, that favorite passage we have from Zechariah where it says, don't despise the day of small beginnings. That's talking about the time where they have a kind of a small construction team to do a huge project. There's no way they can do it. God delights in those moments. If you go to John chapter 6, one of the favorite stories in the New Testament, you know it. Feeding of 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. I love how it says it in John. Because in John, if you go there, it just doesn't say five loaves and two fish. On purpose, the Holy Spirit says five loaves small barley loaves, small it says, and it says two small fish. These are little fish. It's as if God wants to say, yeah, 
You don't think you can do it. Let me, let me even make it seem worse. They're little fish, minnows, little crackers. As if big loaves would have made a difference. God is awesome. And God delights in doing the impossible. And when things seem the darkest, when they seem the bleakest, when the water seems like it's so deep that it's about to go over your head, it is in those moments, church, that God shines the brightest. And if you're in Christ and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit, that Spirit of Christ lives in you. And that water is rising deep. It's at that moment that you can just barely stick your face out of the water. That you should smile big and get excited. Because God moves in powerful ways when we need him. Because he delights in doing the impossible. Years ago, when I was 25, the marriage opportunities for me seemed pretty dark. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to stand up here in this pulpit and tell you something that's not true. No. It was pretty bleak. It was, Kathleen right now, I know this, is going, oh no, what is he going to say? It was pretty dark. And then God gave me the most amazing bride ever, ever in the world for me. I mean, he couldn't have done better. What a miracle of miracles from darkness to victory. Hallelujah. I love you, honey. You're awesome. I was, when we, so I was 25. We're, we're married at 20, just after my 27th birthday, we got married. I was 27. She was 16. It was awesome. <laughs> we were in the South. Don't get, don't judge us. It's okay in the South. It's legal. It was Missouri. We just were across. Is that the, where's the Mason Dixon? I don't know. I think it was legal. No, seriously, she, she was 19 and I was 27. I robbed the cradle big time. I mean, I had to, there was like state trooper. It was, it was crazy. God delights. I use, a, use that, that lighthearted illustration because I know there are a lot of, of heavy, hard, difficult situations when the water's deep. The Jordan is at flood stage. God, why are you choosing now flood stage? It's on purpose. We saw it last week. Because all of a sudden, when things are at flood stage, we can rely on nothing else except Jesus. We rely on God. In those moments, we can't rely on ourselves, and it brings glory to God. 1 Corinthians 1, this was from last week, just to remind ourselves. God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. It goes on later and says, why does he do this? Why would God do this so that no man, no flesh, nothing of the creation would boast before him? And then it says this, let him who boasts, boast in thee. Lord, we boast in Jesus. Why at flood stage, God? So we, when we get through that Jordan River, we get through and all of a sudden we start boasting, but we're not boasting in ourselves. We're boasting in the Lord. Hallelujah. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. What is a theology of prevailing through hardship? What do we learn from from the Israelites to get through, from the wilderness to the promise. How do we get through? How do we prevail? How do we keep going? Start with this. When it seems darkest, know that that is where God shines the brightest. That is where God moves. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Get excited. The Lord delights in doing mighty things in times of trouble. Spurgeon put, says this. Because I want to say that when you get through, your ministry is going to be empowered. When you get through the wilderness to the promise, your ministry is empowered like never before. And God wants to, wants to build us up and mature us. Charles Spurgeon said, I would go, and, go to the deeps. I love that word. 
I would go to the deeps a hundred times to cheer a downcast spirit. And then he tells us why. Why can he keep going down? And why can, he, why can he keep going to those hard places? What makes him able to go there? And then he says, it is good for me to have been afflicted that I might know how to speak a word in season to the one that is weary. How do we prevail through hardship to a better place? Number one, we know that God shines brightest through that spot. Number two, always, 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 and I don't know if I said it, but always choose nearness to God. Always choose nearness to God over any other option. There's a prayer we pray for our children. As a matter of fact, it was, it, it was in the prayer post uh, this today on Facebook, this morning on Facebook. But we always pray this simple little prayer for, for our kids. I might have said this to you before, but often part of the night, the prayers in the evenings for the kids is a simple prayer. Lord, let Espanol, let Sophia, I just scared Espanol, sorry. Let Sophia, let Isabella, whatever the name is, never have to stray from your side to know that the best place to be is right by your side. Some people learn the hard way and they wander away and like the prodigal, praise the Lord, there's the father running to welcome him when he comes back. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. But let us not have to be prodigals to know that the best place to be is near Jesus every day of our lives. Verse 16, the water from upstream stopped flowing. So the f- priests gets their, get their feet wet, and all of a sudden, the water in the Jordan stops. It just feels a lot like the Red Sea that was parted, but now it's the Jordan River. It's at flood stage. The priests carrying the ark, they're ahead of the people. God prescribes that there's supposed to be a distance between the priests and the people. So there's a gap in there. They're walking first. Why the gap? We don't know, but the gap is... is, is in one sense, gives everybody a good perspective of the might and the power of what God's going to do. They walk into the, the water. They're walking in the flood, and all of a sudden, the water from upstream stopped flowing. And it says it piled up, or it flooded, in a sense, in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. This is kind of a miracle, and it's interesting that it's pointed out. The only place in Scripture that you'll find reference to this place called Adam is right here in the Bible. Adam is the same word that was given to Adam in Adam and Eve. It's that means man. Depends upon the commentator, uh, commentary you look at or the scholar that you read. Some would say this is maybe 30 miles away from where they're at, this place. Others would say about 17 or 18 miles away. One commentator said, well, the, the, the really what it's saying is that if you look at Adam here, about 12 miles away is this other place, Zarethan, so they would say it's different. And what they're trying to say is that as the water stopped, a lake began to develop, and that lake was about this lake that went from, from Adam to Zarethan. It began to pile up almost in this, this flood there. But what it means and what you want to see is that the water began, it's deep, it's flood stage during, it's flood stage during the harvest so that the river, uh, the, the, the Jordan is flooding and it's deep and it's running quickly and now all of a sudden it stops and it's as if to say the flood is no longer here where the ark is. The flood, the piling, the heaping up of the water is in a different spot. Where is it at? It's this place called Adam. There's a contrast between, between the flood now in this place called Adam or man and the dry ground over here where the ark is, right in the middle of the river. 
If you want to go man's way and you want, want to look and you, and you go toward man, what are you going to find? You're going to find some deep water. But in the most incredible place in the world, right in the middle of the river, not as it just a miracle that the water stopped, but there's dry ground. Right in the middle of the river, they're able to walk through. Water's no longer there. Man's wisdom, man's way, man's approach, man's answer. What will you find there? Still find a lot of deep water. So how do you have a theology to prevail through hardship and make it through to the promises of God? Nearness to God is always the best option. It's better to be right there near the presence of God, represented by that ark, walking through on dry ground. It's always better. It doesn't make sense. But it's the best way to make it through life. Near to God. The only place, and this is in your notes, to find continued serenity and safety. The only place, church, to find continued peace. To find protection and provision and grace and joy and health and gladness and newness and life. The only place is near to the Lord. Verse 17, the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Praise the Lord. The whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Number three, how to make it through hardship. Gather stones of remembrance all along the way. Look at verse 1 of, of Joshua 4 again. When the, when the whole nation had finished the crossing, I'm sorry, when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, it's important to point out that God is prescribing this whole crossing. He does it in several places. This is one of them. And, and God speaks very clearly and he gives these instructions. These are instructions right from God. This is not Joshua's idea. This is kind of not a neat thing that they had a committee about. This is God. Verse 2, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe. Tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, and carry them over with you and Put them down at the place where you stay tonight. They're going to camp, you'll, you can find this out later, at a place called Gilgal. So they're going to camp later, put stones there. Some commentators, and if you read into this, believe that they put stones right there where they were at the, at the river, and they also did 12 at the place in Gilgal where they camped. You can look at it and some see it, just if there's one pile, some see two piles, doesn't matter. They made a place, they made they, a pile of stones to remember. Stones of remembrance. My question to you is, through your life, are you building, building these places, these, these circumstances to remember the goodness of the Lord? You say, why? In the future, back in chapter 4, verse 6, in the future when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Verse 7, tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones ought to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. What do these stones mean? I'm going to invite our, our worship team to come and to, and to play quietly if they would. And I don't know if we can do this, but I'm going to ask if, I'm just going to share a few thoughts as we close, but I'm going to ask if uh, we can get the lights back to kind of how we do it during worship. And I'm going to 
ask you, everyone in this room, right now, to begin to, in your heart, begin to seek God about your own journey. We're going to move to a place of prayer in a moment, and if you're going through a situation where it is hard, where it is deep and dark and difficult, I would hate to just share the word today and talk about these principles this morning from the Word of God and not begin to together take these needs before Jesus and before His throne. So we're going to pray together. Before we do that, I want to ask you, are you setting up stones of remembrance for your children for another generation, for friends, for others. And when they ask you, what is that? You say, that? Oh, that, let me tell you about that. That is the time that God was mighty. And when it seemed like there was no way to make it over, God brought us over into his promises. And they were true for me. They were true in my life because God's a mighty God. He's a loving Heavenly Father. Let me tell you about those stones. I know I shared this a couple years ago, but perhaps the hardest situation we've ever gone through, and Kathleen can share this so much better than I can, was when Erickson, our oldest son, went through a really difficult illness and he was in the hospital for a number of days and they said he had lesions, tumors on his bones and they said he has one, one of two kinds of cancer. We don't know which kind, we're going to have to do a bone biopsy. This was after all kinds of, all kinds of, he was, they're thinking it was a neurology issue, they went, he, uh, an infectious disease issue and then you find yourself on the cancer floor. That's, that's a, as a parent, I can't think of anything worse and I know there are people who've gone through that in this room. and So there we were. It was the day of his biopsy. And again, there's so much more to this story than I'm going to convey. So if you need to hear about this stone of remembrance, please talk to Kathleen. She'll do a much better job. But it was the day of the, of the surgery, the night before... She had to go home with our kids every night from the hospital. I stayed at the hospital, but that in itself was rough. She was in tears more than I can say. I was in tears in a bathroom trying not to let my son know about this and see his dad like that. And the next morning, we're all done. The doctors come in the room, and I'm just fast-forwarding this. And the doctor said these words, said, Erickson, I don't know what you had done. And I just want to say that that morning, after that surgery, they had to do a surgical procedure to do the biopsy. For the first time in weeks, his fever broke. They, he, they always had to keep giving him medication to keep his fever away. His fever broke, and he started eating. He had an appetite. He hadn't had an appetite for weeks. So... And the doctor came in and said, Erickson, don't know what you did, but you do not have cancer. And we had to go up for follow-ups, and they, they would do these scans, and they'd check all the tumors. They said the tumors are all dormant. They're, 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 the lesions are all dormant. They're there. We see them, but they're all dormant. God is awesome, church. God is awesome. God is awesome. But there, but, and again, she can tell the story. There was something like, I want to say, three or four times that she would come home and it was as if God, and we may have a picture of this, we were talking about it, but it was as if God was giving her a stone of remembrance. 
she would come home and she would, in the middle of this, before that happened, well, when it was the darkest and the worst, she would drive and there at our house, the way our house is situated and the evening sun is, comes, she, there were these rainbows that would go right over our home. And she saw like three or four, it's four, four rainbows in a matter of as many days, perhaps. We never see that. And so now, when we see any rainbow, we saw one the other day. There was one here at the church, and uh, we, had, we saw one at our house the other day, and it always reminds us of the awesome power of the living God. But there's a stone of remembrance. There's a, there's a, you say, Eric, okay, that's a, a rainbow. What do, we, do I take pictures? What do I do? What do you mean? Do I set up stones in my yard? I, I just want to say this. There's, there's no greater. There's no greater monument to the goodness of God than what, what Peter calls, and it's a different reference, but Peter calls you and me in Christ living stones. That's what he says. You are a walking talking monument to the goodness and the grace and the wonder of God. And when your children look at you and when you act unlike their friends' parents act or when you do something in a way that looks different, what are you? You are a stone of remembrance to the power and the grace and the goodness of the living God. It's for your children, your friends, your loved ones. There's no greater monument to the Lord than a changed, redeemed, on fire for Jesus life, shining brightly. Look what the Lord has done. I'm going to invite you to stand if you would.